So shall we begin? So warm good morning. You can start. Okay. A warm good morning and welcome back to the international online conference on theory and discursive practices in the age of interdisciplinarity, organized by the Postgraduate Department of English, Vardhamanda College, in collaboration with Yomphila Centenary College, Royal University of Bhutan. We are fortunate to have Dr. Prantik Banerjee. We are fortunate to have Dr. Prantik Banerjee, Associate Professor, Hislop College, Nagpur, as the keynote sp speaker of the session. And he'll be probing into the intersection of literature and energy resources in his paper, Petrofiction or Petrification, Narratives of Oil in a Hydrocarbon Age. Dr. Banerjee is an accomplished academician and a much sought after resource person who has delivered lectures in various universities across the length and breadth of the country. He has proved his expertise in the fields of literary theory, culture studies, film and media studies, genetology, and pandemic narratives. His proficiency and scholarly assertiveness won him various positions such as national faculty trainer for IISA and RUSA, external advisor to NAC at reputed colleges and universities, an expert member on the drafting committee of NICC's national higher education policy, and member of board of studies in various universities. This multi-potentialist multi personality has been published, has many published poems and short stories to his credit. His latest book, Cultural Studies, Texts and Context, provides a detailed commentary on the path-breaking writings of cultural theorists like Reynold Williams, Stuart Hall, Walter Benjamin, etc. And this promising book will be of immense help to students, teachers, and researchers alike. Dr. Banerjee, we're extremely delighted and privileged to have you here in our midst today. With due respect and courtesy, may I welcome you, sir, to this online conference and also invite you for the keynote address. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Just checking the systems again. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Fine. Right. Uh, so, first of all, to begin with, uh, let me express my profuse thanks to uh, Dr. Mini Abraham, uh, who's been communicating with me and um, to, the, to the principal and the entire faculty, and the staff and students of uh, Bharat Mahatma College. Also, special thanks to uh, uh, two of my dear friends, uh, Dr. Jay Singh, uh, the organizing secretary, and the uh, co convener, Dr. Chitra, and also greetings uh, from his club college to uh, Dr. Rose. Sebastian, the convener of, uh, of this particular international conference, this online international conference. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, good morning, dear participants. Thank you so much for having me here. Join you all on this platform. And hopefully, in the next 90 minutes, um, I will be able to do uh, what I'm supposed to do. Uh, friends, uh, <clears throat> uh, when I read your uh, the, the conference brochure, the conference subject, uh, sort of uh, taking up something something uh, that might be that might be a little inflammatory and incendiary. I mean, uh, the subject that I'm going to speak on is uh, a rather combustible subject, an inflammatory theme because uh, because it easily it easily in, uh, fuels extreme passions and ignites very strong reactions from all quarters. I mean, think of what you did recently when you woke up uh, to find in the newspapers uh, the government announcing another hike in petrol price. Uh, you probably, like most of us, you also probably dashed off to the nearest petrol pump to tank up the vehicle before, it, uh, <laughs> before, before, uh, before the hike in the fuel price burnt another hole, a huge hole in your pocket. Um, well, if I said that petroleum and its products have uh, saturated, that oil has fueled, that petroleum and oil and energy has driven our lives. Uh, it would seem to be stating an obvious truth. I mean, um, in, a, in a documentary, an award-winning documentary, which came out somewhere in the early 2000s, um, this, you know, the voiceover, the documentary begins, it's called The Crude Awakening. 
It's called a crude awakening, and the documentary begins with a voiceover saying, oil is our god. Oil is our god. We all worship petroleum. Um, <laughs> so clearly much has happened since Nietzsche announced the death of God. Uh, so uh, the voiceover of this award-winning documentary, A Crude Awakening, and notice the pun on the, in the title of this documentary, very intelligently and imaginatively, imaginatively tried title, the word crude, uh, says that oil is our God, uh, we all are uh, petroleum worshippers. Uh, it is, in fact, undeniable. I mean, there's no gain saying the fact that our lives are saturated in oil. It, it, it is the most significant resource <clears throat> of our modern capitalist consumerist lifestyle. Indeed, oil is everywhere. I mean, uh, but the strange thing is that uh, even, if, even, if it, even, even if oil is everywhere around us, uh, it is ubiquitous. Yet, strangely enough, or paradoxically enough, it seems... Uh, uh, rather invisible, invisible. It, it, oil determines, of course, how and where we live, how we move, how we work, how we play, what we eat, what we wear, what we consume. Uh, to say the least, therefore, that oil has, uh, you know, is heavily invested in the shaping of our political, our economic and physical landscapes. But to think about oil, to think about oil friends is not just to think about automobiles or derricks or spectacular spillovers or uh, or even the price of barrel uh, barrels <clears throat> oil barrels I mean. I mean think about it the computer or the laptop uh, or the smartphone on which you and I are connected today on this platform is in fact made out of a uh, out of a material from you know from oil in fact without oil one one would say that the well-oiled uh, levers of our world economy, of our world system, um, would collapse, as is often the case when there is a sharp fall in um, in the production or uh, in the production of oil, or whenever there is a steep hike in oil prices. So it is no exaggeration to say that our modern culture is a hydrocarbon culture, or that our twenty-first century culture is a petro culture, is a petro driven culture. So in, in a sense that, you know, what, what I'm trying to bring to your attention is that oil, when we talk about oil, oil makes us not only go, not only go in the physical sense as a mode, as something that fuels our modes of transportation, something that makes possible for us to move from one place to another. But more importantly, um, and this is the central thesis of, of my talk today, and more importantly, Oil and its uh, uh, its its commodities, its product, petroleum products, are the ones that drive ideas and ideals that define, determine, and shape our uh, modernity. So, while it is an obvious truth that as human society, you know, human societies have required energy to function uh, down the ages, it is it is sort of less recognized that there is a deep connection. There is a deep connection between. Uh, between between energy and culture, uh, it's not too visible. Oil's discourse or oil's narrative, as it seeps into our lives, as it sort of uh, not only determines our political economy, but also has um, a profound influence on our social and cultural imaginaries. This is something that is perhaps not too obvious. So deep embedded and invisible is the discourse of oil in relation to in relation to culture, in relation to politics, and in relation to society. So this deep connection, this deep connection between oil, literature, culture, and society is the one that has become the site of, uh, of much interdisciplinary critical inquiry in recent times. Um, so in my, in my talk today, what I propose to do is to, is to examine uh, literature's relation with energy sources uh, from the perspective, from the lens, using the lens of... Uh, what you might call uh, Marxist eco uh, ecological Marxism, and uncover uncover the not so the, the not so visible intersections between oil culture and society, and the critical discourses that are embedded within it. So I'm going to run my talk. I'm going to run my talk uh, fueled by uh, some interesting uh, interesting questions uh, for us. Um, is oil 
is soil simply a material resource or does it possess um, does it possess a cultural capital how are uh, you know how are art culture and literature how are the cultural expressions the imaginative expressions of our capitalist modernity how are they entwined with the with the material resources uh, of uh, with the with the materiality of natural resources uh, um, of a particular age what is the relationship what is the relationship between oil encounter and that we by that i mean the encounter between uh, oil rich for example oil rich the oil rich global north or the oil rich societies and uh, the and oil consuming first world societies or the global global yeah global north countries so i mean one one does one has to remember that the politics of colonialism the politics of post colonialism were and are animated they continue to be animated uh, by by the uh, competitive struggle by the competitive struggle to find uh, to access and to uh, to claim energy resources in different periods of time so the point one among the many questions therefore that one sees one perceives in the interconnection or the intersection between oil and its influence on culture and society is for example that if we examine from if we examine literature from the oil perspective then does an inquiry about oil's visibility in literary texts in literary or cultural texts for example do how does it change our critical reading practices can an can an energy driven approach provide uh, the necessary interpretive in, interpretive strategies or 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 as said would say contrapuntal aesthetics to help us understand uh, how the materiality and worldliness of energy is embedded in 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 literary fiction um, is it possible is it even possible to formulate a semiotics of oil so these are some of the you know these are some of the questions that perhaps uh, i will take up and um, and hopefully the deliberations or hopefully it will lead to a certain amount of uh, Exchange of deliberations. Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, can I share my? Let me share, share my screen with you. Do let me know. So this is the yeah. So you know uh, this particular award-winning documentary, which I said uh, is titled "The Food Awakening," is one that sort of asks uh, this apocalyptic question or end of oil scenario: What happens when we run? What happens to us as as society? What happens to our culture? What happens to our political economy? What happens when we run out of oil? Uh, what we once thought the oil reserves to be abundantly rich are after all uh, finite resources so what happens when we run out of oil and so this is the nightmarish uh, this is the question uh, you know which sort of envisages a nightmarish future uh, that this particular documentary uh, in that uh, examines um but before i enter into you know uh, and in, enter into this intersection between oil culture society and environment uh, let me attempt to frame my talk by what we call ecological marxism petroculture well this is um, some of the salient features that probably when we talk about petroculture when we talk about the 21st century not just being a postmodern culture but also one that is defined that is driven by hydrocarbon uh, petroleum well um, stephanie limanaga uh, she is one of the prominent um, uh, hydrocarbon or energy humanist and critics and she's the one who says that petroculture is modern culture and uh, as the slide shows to you that when we talk about uh, the 21st century society being a petroculture society then uh, what are its distinguishing features uh, what some some that are prescriptive and normative and some that are species defining so <clears throat> 
uh, deep down, I mean, when we talk about petroculture, we are not talking about oil as merely a material commodity whose, whose, physical, whose physical abundance, at least so far, has uh, sort of enabled us to do what we want. But it is also to examine how oil, in fact, imprints, how oil seeps and imprints uh, its uh, influence uh, on the very ontology of our being the way we live, the way we imagine, the way we create, the way we produce, everything seems to be um, uh, 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 connected, deeply connected or deeply meshed by the narratives of oil, or should I say the pipelines of oil. So um, before I do that, I mean, um, you know, a traditional or conventional Marxism, we all are approach, we all have new theory in our classrooms and we do talk about Marxist approaches to literature, but um, in recent times there has been uh, the emergence of a new um, a new approach where uh, ecology or questions of deep ecology or ecology or environment um, is uh, sort of married to Marxist theory, and so ecological Marxism is a sort of is the application of the ideas of Karl Marx uh, to the to the study and analysis of nature and its resources, uh, resources such as oil, coal, tar, um, spices, um, all of these as are, you know, as a typical Marxist approach would be, all of them are considered as, as a capital commodity, something that something that fuels and charges and energizes, energizes not only the not only political economy, but also sort of directs and influences the social relationships between labor, capital, um, labor, labor and capital. So um, one would say that ecological Marxism is based on the fundamental premise, the Marxist premise that the problem of nature is a problem of capital. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, when we read Marx, whether it is uh, uh, particularly his his his, his uh, seminal work, Capital, Marx developed a theory of ecological crisis. Now now that we know as uh, what we call the theory of metabolic rift, uh, because he perceived history, he perceived history and nature to be one, uh, as being intrinsically in connected with each other. Uh, it is uh, in the German ideology, you know, Marx and Engels uh, wrote that um, we know only one science, and the, and the lines are there on your slide, and it says, we know that there is only one science, the science of history, and history can be viewed from two sides. It can be divided into the history of nature and the history of man. And the two sides, however, are not seen uh, to be as independent entities, as separate entities, but um, uh, they say that as long as man has existed, nature and man have affected each other. So one can easily see that, uh, you know, Marx is uh, what we call dialectical history dialectical materialism or what we call historical materialism is deeply embedded in concerns in in concerns uh, concerns about concerns about environment concerns about nature in fact it wouldn't be wrong to say that marx's historical materialism is uh, also it sort of um, uh, incorporates it includes uh, ecological materialism as well so uh, you know, the emergence of, uh, in recent years, the emergence of Marxist ecological theories in culture and literary studies, which again is interdisciplinary, it sort of demonstrates the relevance of Marx's uh, dialectical theory of dialectical materialism. And Marx's, um, what, what Marx's material history uh, does is to give us a, a, method a, a methodological tool a, a specific way to study the exchange between humans and nature as a mode of production and their larger impact upon society and culture. So uh, the aim of Marxist ecological, ecological theorists, um, uh, however, is not to, um, how do I put it, is, is not to really Marxize, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, allow me this rather ugly word, uh, it, it, it's not to Marxize ecology, but maybe to ecologize Marxism. And in recent years, in recent years, um, uh, prominent Marxist ecological critics, um, and some of them I would be mentioning, uh, like Imre, uh, Imre Zeman and uh, Stephanie Lemenegger and Frederick Buell, in their work on hydro, they've done a lot of work, good work, fascinating studies on hydrocarbon societies, where they focus on 
the way in which the saturation of our culture and aesthetics is actually driven by the energy of fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and gas. So, um, in their in their um, in their cultural analysis, what they have, in fact, what they have reread and reinterpreted a wide range of literary texts, uh, you know, uh, ranging from the writings of Dickens and Conrad to Steinbeck and Amitabh Ghosh, where um, the predominant trope, the predominant trope has been some energy source or the other. And, and this itself makes it a very fascinating intervention into the field of culture studies. So if you ask me, you know, what do Marxist ecologist theories do in the interpretation of culture or in the rereading of uh, literary writings, then, well, we might say that they do the following things. Uh, uh, one is that they sort of map the specific encounters, uh, the specific encounters between literary cultural forms, aesthetics, and uh, postmodern politics or petromodern politics. Uh, uh, they, they also uncover uh, the slippery and often uh, viscous connections that fossil fuels have with wage labor and capital, and as you can, as as is evident from this from the bullet points in the slide, uh, the point is that you know that behind behind these interventions, into the in, interventions uh, that ecological Marxist ecological critics do in the study of hybrid carbon societies. It is the acceptance or the underlying, it is it, the underlying premise seems to be that oil is the poor commodity. It is the poor commodity in our uh, post industrial and, high, and hydrocarbon modernity. And so Marx's critique of capitalism and its intersection, its, its intersection with contemporary ecological theory uh, provides a wonderful, provides a very definitive framework to. To examine for us to examine the infusion of oil into our culture, to, which includes, of course, literature. Uh, this is again a very fascinating work, um, History of Oil, oil Cultures by Frederick Bull. And um, it is it, it in this text, um, in this work, uh, Bull considers, you know, what he calls the dialectics of fuel as. Uh, and by that he means, you know, the interplay between two types of culture. He defines that the dialectics of oil or the dialectics of fuel is sort of uh, is a combination of uh, the tensions, the overriding tensions and conflict between two kinds of culture. Uh, one he calls as material culture, and the second he calls as symbolic culture. Both of which, according to him, modify a society's concept of the individual and the and the environment. Um, so material culture, according to Buell, uh, denotes, uh, you know, the transformation brought about by, let us say, uh, the oil industry or the petrochemical industry, while symbolic culture refers to the representations of this hydrocarbon reality in different forms of art and literature, uh, whether it is films, whether it is fiction, or whether it is documentaries, or whether it is even poster art. So Buell conceives, or Buell conceives, rather, <laughs> Buell conceives, uh, uh, in fact, history as a succession of what he calls energy systems, energy systems, uh, a concept that obviously he derives from Marx's mode of production and which he believes, you know, you know are constituted, these energy systems, he says, are constituted by, by sociocultural, economic, environmental and technological, uh, uh, technological relationships. So, uh, uh, he makes this fascinating argument that, you know, these energy systems, uh, societies in different epochs, in different eras are in fact, can be looked at uh, as energy systems. And these energy systems or energy driven societies have been characterized by uh, the dominance of a particular source of energy, such as coal, gas, petroleum, or, or oil, at, in a particular point in history. Uh, and these have impacted these, uh, the predominant, the, pre the predominant energy form in a particular society has impacted, uh, impacted our modes of being, the modes of being and imagining of people living in those conditions. Um, it, it, it is a fact that oil's investment, therefore, in, in the way in which we live our lives today has become so overwhelming that it has led to the growth of, as I said, petroculture. 
However, and this is the great enigma, I mean, this is the paradox, that what is very surprising is that despite oil's uh, uh, permeability, its, its uh, infusion into our life, uh, it has found very little correspond corresponding expression in cultural modes, whether it is fiction, uh, whether it is fiction or in, whether it is fiction films up until now. In fact, oil's, um, the discourse around oil, the discourse surrounding oil has been uh, limited to, to techno-industrial circles and to green debates over, over an imperiled uh, uh, ecology. But it has had no narrative presence, no significant narrative presence in any kind of mainstream literary writing till the 1980s, if, um, if, one, if one actually looks to find out uh, oil's visibility in, in mainstream fiction, then uh, it's rather surprising that despite its, in, despite its infusion, its complete immersion in the way in which we live our lives, in the way in which we produce and consume our cultures, that oil, uh, that oil has had no narrative presence in, in, in sort of mainstream literary writings, uh, other than, of course, a rare exception like uh, um, uh, this American, American writer named Upton Sinclair, who, who who wrote a novel bearing the same name, that is Oil, and which was published in, um, in, in 1927. And here is therefore the paradox, or rather here is this intriguing, intriguing puzzle uh, that compared to you know, what we call great themes of literature, uh, wars, partition, natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, and famines, energy, or rather, energy has played a rather muted role in the field of literary studies. In, in, in recent decades, however, it has gained considerable traction in cult, as, a, as a cultural capital and has become an important trope in, uh, in cultural narratives. So oil or oil-driven or energy-driven sources are now finding, are finding more and more cultural expressions in many narrative modes, whether it is fiction, whether it is non-fiction, films, documentaries, or, or other, other art forms such as installation art, for instance. So fiction writers particularly uh, <clears throat> have found in the power and diffusion of oil a rich vein, a rich source of themes, tropes, and symbols. And, 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 and many modern writers have in fact mined, mined the 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 uh, an entire protocol of you know themes images and technique and and also evolved techniques in order to write a particular kind of uh, fiction that we may call petrofiction. So one would one one could say that the trickle of oil has spilled over to literary writing, spawning spawning a new kind of genre called petrofiction. And this brings me to the question of. Um, the history of the term petrofiction itself. Do let me know if my slides are moving. Yes, sir, it is. Right. Um, well, um, it's of course, uh, I mean, uh, Amitav Ghosh who coined the term petrofiction. Uh, in an in an essay called Petrofiction, the oil the oil encounter and the novel, you know, he was reviewing he was reviewing uh, a novel called uh, Cities of Salt, written by a Saudi Arabian writer named uh, Abdul Rahman Munif, and um, uh, th this essay published almost uh, a quarter a, you know a quarter of a century ago, published in 1992 was titled Petrofiction, The Oil Encounter and the Novel. So what is, um, you know, what is the, what is the essay about? Um, what Ghosh, you know, in this essay, Ghosh famously laments that the lack of fiction, he finds that there is, that there is a lack of fiction which addresses oil and what he terms the oil encounter, particularly with, with reference to American fiction. A lack of interest, according to him, which is shown by American novelists in, in engaging with the historical intertwining of the fates of Americans and the peoples of the Middle East over this resource. Now, uh, this might seem to be an outrageous argument, but actually, when you think of, 
you know, we, we, we do American, we teach American literature as well in our, in our PG courses. And um, so the minute we think of about American literature or modern American fiction, we, we talk about the great American dream and which is one of the archetypal tropes that is, uh, that we find in all kinds of American, whether it is the American novel or poetry. And one of the one of the things that if we dig deeper a little, if we explore it a bit deeper, is um, that you know when we talk about uh, the American dream, the American dream was a was a was a stood like a cultural metaphor, or, or, or it indicated a sort of a lifestyle, a lifestyle which is impossible to imagine other than its centrality, because it depended centrally on on automobility. A certain automobility, a certain, you know, it's very notion of individualism and uh, and a self-sufficient, the self-sufficient, the idea of a self-sufficient uh, 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 family. All of these are in fact inseparable uh, from um, from the influence of petrol or from the influence of the narratives of the materiality as well as the narratives of the petrol petrol industry that. Uh, came into being in the 40s and the 50s. There was an explosion of uh, oil surplus in American society uh, post-World War. So oil, surprise, oil therefore, uh, you know, was very much a part, was the defining feature of American culture. And it sort of fueled the very notion, the very notion of the great American dream. And what uh, Amitabh Ghosh therefore points out is that Despite the fact that, or, despite oil's permeability, therefore, its huge influence on in shaping and defining the American mode of being, it still, it did not surprisingly find uh, imaginative expressions. It, it was not engaged and taken up by American writers throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So he asks um, uh, this one, is this very fascinating question that, you know, that if there is so much of oil in American life, then, then uh, when there is so much to write about, as the slide tells you, as a quote, there's a quote from that uh, from the essay, that if there is so much to write about, um, uh, has this encounter? Why has this encounter proved to be the oil encounter has proved to be so imaginatively uh, sterile? And Ghosh offers multiple reasons. I mean, um, uh, but among the several reasons, I, we don't have the time to go into the detail. Uh, what he says, but the most important uh, reason that he unearths to show the dearth of fiction, to explain the dearth of fiction, particularly American fiction, uh, in addressing the, 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 the impact of oil uh, is what he calls, um, you know, he says, uh, just a minute, I have the full quote that is on this, that is given on the slide, let me quote. Yeah. He says to a great many Americans, to a great many Americans, oil smells bad. It, it reeks of unavoidable overseas entanglement, a worrisome foreign dependency, economic uncertainty, risky and expensive military enterprises of thousands of dead civilians and children and all, and all the troublesome questions that lie buried in their graves. And to make things still worse, it begins to smell of pollution and environmental hazards. It reeks, it stinks, it becomes a problem that can be written about only in the language of solution. So this is the entire quote, uh, part of which you find on your slide. So the point here really is that in the essay, Ghosh establishes a sort of a historical parallel, you know, between between the spice trade of the 18th and the 19th centuries and the oil trade of the 20th century. And what he finds similar between, uh, between spice and oil um, is, there, is, there, is, there, is their strategic and economic value and the extent of their political, social, and cultural impact in far, in far flung places. But, but with one difference, and this is again very important, with one difference, as he says, that whereas the spice trade Whereas the spice the spice trade in the in the beginning from the in the 18th and 19th century sort of spawned and it inspired a rich body of literature of, of European writings, including uh, the Lusades going back to 16th century to perhaps even Amitabh Ghosh's most recent uh, book that you see on your slide, uh, uh, the, the nutmeg 
the nutmeg call uh, the nut the nutmeg curse which sort of in which again a, 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 ex, explores it sort of unearths the hidden roots of um, colonial trade colonial trade which which impacted uh, and and uh, even uh, uh, you know destroyed the indigenous culture of the java islands which was which was rich in nutmeg so uh, what he finds is that um, yeah, that whereas the spice trade you know of the 18th and 19th centuries uh, is reflected uh, it finds its presence both in terms of theme in terms of uh, in terms of con subject in, in in terms of subject engagement in the right in european writings um, uh, this has not happened with the dis uh, the discovery of oil has not seen a similar manifestation in in in, in lit it has had very little uh, literary output so as Ghosh says, it is as if, you know, the history of oil, uh, Ghosh says, is a matter of embarrassment, uh, verging on uh, the unspeakable, the pornographic. So Ghosh's standpoint um, may remind us in a, parrot, in a sort of um, inverted way of the critical stance of uh, the Marxist political theorist, uh, such as uh, uh, Frederick Jameson. I mean, I'm talking to Frederick Jameson, who in... Um, in his book, uh, the political unconscious argues that uh, that 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 narrative that narrative is central to our understanding of reality. All narratives, as as this uh, um, as this uh, uh, you know text, uh, the the book political unconscious says that all narrative must be read uh, for their connections with the concrete. For their connections with the concrete material realities that is outside, uh, which James, of course, calls this approach that he calls to literature and culture, uh, investigating the in, the intig, intricate relationship between material resources, the material reality, and the shaping of culture. Uh, is what he calls him that he uses. Uh, Jameson's political unconsciousness is reflected in the deliberate concealment, what I would call in the deliberate concealment of oil's cultural pervasiveness. I mean, you know, as a the 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 the, the, the sort of social and political anxieties that are generated uh, in a post-industrial society about oil are I argue, are perversely made inexpressible in any form of narration, including the novel. It is as if the very slipperiness of oil or as if the very nature and form, its sort of viscous fluidity sort of uh, challenges and defies its cultural representation. And so uh, in this, uh, you know, Ghosh, what Ghosh argued in, uh, in that 1992 essay on petro, what where he used the word petrofiction for the first time, uh, he has carried that narrative to examine the uh, examine the nature of our material resources and its impact on environment degradation. Also, in uh, a book that we all perhaps have read called *The Great Derangement*, and uh, where Ghosh again ex explores, you know, or rather deplores our inability at the level of life, at the level of history, at the level of literature and politics, uh, to, grasp, to grasp the scale and violence of climate change caused by our uh, carbon economy. So one, if, if one were to map, you know, if one were to map the visibility or invisibility of oil or, or energy uh, and its impact upon society and environment, then one would say, that from the great acceleration, what was what used to be called as the great ex acceleration of the 1950s and 60s, where uh, you know more and more rich oil reserves were found across the world, and suddenly it's sort of much like the Victorian op optimism on unbridled uh, uh, progress and growth. Uh, suddenly there was this euphoria about this new, uh, uh, new abundant. Uh, about, uh, about the abundance of this new resource called the black gold, and therefore it was appropriately called black gold. So from that great acceleration, uh, where the abundance of oil resources sort of energized and accelerated the process of industrial uh, industrial growth and, and, and world over uh, the progress of humanity, uh, one would say that one can map the trajectory of this intersection between energy and, and, and culture from the great acceleration of the 1950s and 60s to the increasing real, 
to what uh, Ghosh calls the great derangement in the 90s and into the 21st century, clearly where, uh, where the earlier euphoria, the earlier optimism and euphoria about oil, about the use of these energy resources that would uh, that promised so much of uh, so much of growth has unfortunately had its debilitating effect upon, upon uh, environment and leading to climate warming, global warming. And, uh, um, so, uh, so Ghosh is, you know, Ghosh himself again. Now, many of us uh, who teach Ghosh, who have researched on Ghosh, uh, Ghosh himself has not been silent on oil. I mean, uh, as a writer, I mean, in, 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 the circ in the Circle of Reason, one of his early books, he provides a critique of oil capitalism, of global oil capitalism, and an aspect that is not really seldom explored in, in critical interpretations uh, of the novel. Um, you see, um, while oil, yes, oil, oil is not central uh, to the plot, yet, yet, uh, if one examines a novel, one reads the novel from an energy perspective, then it's not difficult to find that the thematic and structural motors of the novel are fueled by oil, especially in the second section titled, uh, uh, titled Raja's Passion, because it is in this section that Ghosh takes the story to a, uh, to a fictional oil emirate called uh, Al Ghazira somewhere in, in the Middle East and uh, shows how the shenanigans of a, of a U.S. oil company destroys the life and culture of the local, uh, of the local populace. So apart from, you know, apart from being a scathing indictment of oil capitalism, Ghosh's, Ghosh's novel um, may, also highlights, yeah, and, and this is again what, what comes out when we read literature from an energy perspective, because it does highlight even the misery and sufferings of migrant laborers uh, from Asia uh, to to uh, to provide cheap labor uh, to uh, uh, migrant laborers who work in oil rigs and oil refineries uh, in the Gulf, and leading therefore to the large scale migration, or you could say displacement. Displacement. What what we, what one would one would call an example of what I would call petro diaspora. So the cir the circle of reason therefore may be regarded as an example of petro fiction, one that invites uh, a detailed petro uh, um, reinterpretation. So to, to repeat my point, you know, the kind of uh, the lack of oil fiction that uh, sort of Ghosh laments more than 25 years, lamented 25 years ago, has, uh, uh, is increasingly now finding uh, a literary repost. Uh, the intersection of oil, oil capitalism, petrol, oil capitalism and oil politics has drawn the attention of a number of writers across the globe, especially uh, from those places which we call the hotspots, hotspots of oil extraction and and uh, and politics, um, uh, yeah. What you see on your slide are examples, uh, a selection of what I call the burning titles. Uh, uh, petrofiction, petrofiction writers have emerged in the last couple of. Uh, uh, you know, the last two decades, in fact, last two or three decades, and one who have engaged themselves in their narratives with the with the impact of oil on culture, on society, and the environment. Uh, Nigerian, for example, the first one on your slide, Oil on Water. I mean, this is a book written by the Nigerian author, uh, Helen Avila. And, you know, it's one of the foremost examples of fiction taking head on the terrible consequences of the oil encounter. Which in his country, you know, oil was discovered in the fifties, nineteen fifties, and uh, and so the narrative, the story, the novel tells us what happens when a multinational oil company joins hands with um, uh, with a corrupt local government to extract oil with complete disregard to the people and the environment. The second book that you see on your slide is uh, Cities of Salt. Cities of Salt. Um, this again is a quintet series. In fact, it's a it's a series of books. Uh, it's a series of five novels written by the Saudi Arabian novelist uh, Rahman Munif. It was originally written in uh, in uh, in Arabic, but then translated. Uh, not all the books are translated. I think three of the first three of the five books are translated. But but again, Cities of Salt, the one that Amitabh Ghosh. Uh, reviewed in that 1992 essay. Uh, 
what we witness again in this novel is the first encounter of an American oil company um, you know, with a with a local Bedouin population. And what happens? The subsequent this, uh, it leads to the subsequent uprooting and displacement of in, of, in, of an indigenous tribe who, before the before the before the sort of contact with, uh, with the multinational company, were living in harmony with their environment, with the land, and with their environment. Uh, Texaco and um, Greenbow are also examples. This, this is just a representative selection. I mean, if you were to Google petrofiction, any young researcher wanting to enter into the interdisciplinary study of uh, petrofiction or energy, energy humanities, uh, if you were to Google petrofiction, then you would find uh, any number, a good 15 to 20 novels that have been, that have been written in recent years. Uh, uh, the point, therefore, is to is that Oil, which was rather invisible, the, the, the uh, in in literary in the literary output throughout uh, the uh, throughout the twentieth century, is finding more and more visibility in contemporary fiction. And what you see, therefore, on the slide, are some prominent uh, are, are some writers who have been who have been dealing with uh, uh, oil and its engagement in the in their narratives. So. Um, what is you know these these examples of petrofiction that have emerged from different parts of the uh, world uh, um, sort of constitute a literary subgenre uh, that we have already called uh, petrofiction, but one which I find has a specific aim now. Uh, you know uh, these writings, disparate writings written coming from different locations, uh, show a shared concern of oil's impact on society, culture, and environment, and therefore uh, you know. Uh, Therefore, if you ask me, uh, how do we define uh, petrofiction? If petrofiction has now evolved into a corpus, a body of substantial, a substantial body of work, then what are some of the distinctive features that we find in petro narratives? So, so these are some of the, uh, these are self-explanatory. I need not explain to them, explain these uh, uh, points to you. They are self-evident. But what you can see is that. Um, the the the, uh, the critical inquiry into petrofiction uh, yields um, yields uh, so many you know so many deep points complex points of points of intervention makes makes petrofiction a very very fascinating body of writings to approach from whether you are approaching it from ecology or whether you are taking in fact the intersection of ecology with Marxism or for that matter even post colonial criticism. Um, So the visibility of oil and the impact of hydrocarbon culture is, is shown not only in fiction, but it has its its visit a sign, a symptomatic, a symptom of its increasing visibility seen also in popular culture. And uh, so, so, so you know, the the production of petroculture in recent times has spawned a range of narratives, range of narratives right from um, uh, science fiction to experimental fiction to to installation art. So, so what this means really is, uh, as uh, Imre Zeman, uh, the, the energy humanist critic says is that, and I, and I quote here, what, she's, what he says is that the outpouring of um, engagement of oil in different modes of popular, of culture and literature shows that, and I quote, he says, any and all examples, any and all examples of cultural expression in the era of oil has to be seen as crucially figured by its material, metaphorical, and, and, social, and social relations. So, um, you know, uh, so right from, I wonder whether, uh, you know, when I, when I was growing up, uh, I, uh, read this comic book uh, about Tintin, uh, the Tintin series, Land of Black Gold, uh, uh, by the very, very famous Belgian artist, and comic writer in Berger. And uh, Land of, uh, even in comics, therefore, there has been, it isn't as if energy has, or oil specifically has not been tackled. It, it's not there as an important thing, but you can see that even, even in a Tintin comic, such as the Land of Black Gold, sort of places where this which takes us, where the whole story revolves around, uh, an oil-rich country, 
an oil rich uh, uh, city somewhere in the Middle East, which is taken over by, by uh, European by European oil diggers. Uh, what happens then? Uh, this the oil narratives has also led to uh, you know political criticism like Ezra Levin's uh, a very famous work uh, uh, called Ethical Oil, the ethics of oil, in fact, the ethics of hydrocarbon energy and its impact on society. Uh, that has been examined by uh, in a very famous groundbreaking work uh, called Ethical Oil by Ezra Levin. Uh, what you see on the top slide uh, is, in fact, what we call uh, visual ac oil activism, visual oil activism. This is uh, an art installation by a pair of French uh, artists called, uh, it's called the London Mastaba. The oil, inst the art installation is called the London Mastaba. And it's basically the, the kind of pyramid shape, the pyramid shape that you see is installed by putting together um, a, a number of oil barrels, uh, painted of course, uh, and they call it the London Mastaba. And it's placed in, uh, in, uh, in a lake near Hyde Park in London. Uh, all of these narratives, whether it is in graphic fiction, whether it is in comic book or oil installation, uh, the bottom images that you see, uh, for example, is the is a photography is the is the photograph, the middle picture of, against the background backdrop of oil burning, uh, and the camels there uh, is an is uh, um, a series of um, photographs done by. Um, by Edward Butinsky. Uh, so the point really is that, yes, the oil is becoming more and more visible in different forms of cultural, uh, cultural narratives, not just literature. Uh, and these are of what perhaps Lawrence Buell calls uh, toxic discourses. Toxic discourses where any is a sort of narrative that exposes our anxiety, that uh, an anxiety or a, or a concern that arises from a perceived threat uh, to uh, to environment, a sort of an environmental bazaar. So it obviously, you know, this visibility or this intersection between oil, environment, culture, and society leads us to ask of what use is uh, petrofiction? And I think um, uh, one of the, one energy humanist critic, uh, I find uh, this particular quote uh, making a very important position, uh, stating a very important position. Uh, this is by Graham MacDonald, and he's, uh, the book is The Resources of Culture. And he says, of, and I quote what is there on your slide, um, he says, fiction, fiction in its various, fiction in its various modes, genres, and histories offer a significant and relatively untapped repository for the energy aware scholar to demonstrate how through successive epochs, particularly embedded kinds of energy create a predominant and oftentimes alternative culture of being and imagining in the world, organizing and enabling a prevalent mode of living, thinking, moving, dwelling, and working. So, so petrofiction friends, uh, one may argue, um, is a genre is a genre that kind of keeps the eco-critical discourse alive. I mean, in 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 interrogating in interrogating the many issues related to oil, its colonial past, its new colonial present, uh, the greed and uh, the greed and machinations of mega oil companies, the destruction of local societies, the 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 displacement uh, the displacement or forced migration of of labor. Uh, Particularly from Africa and in and uh, and and South Asia, um, its exploitation, the exploitation of the oil companies of natural and human resources, all of these sort of enables petrofiction. It sort of energizes an ecological and Marxist interpretation of oil's effect on uh, on these on these many things, and it it basically asks us to discover the processes by which, you know, embedded embedded narratives of energy have created, how have they created dominant and sometimes alternative counter narratives or counter cultures of being and meaning in the world. So uh, uh, in, in, in the least, in the least, you know, energy driven interpretations of 
reading literature, of rereading literature, or reinterpreting cultural forms, uh, what it does is it, it sort of helps us to pose the right questions. It sort of uh, it adds, it enriches our understanding of what petro narratives are doing. For example, um, does does literature, you know, does literature shape and shift in accordance with the dominant energy form? of the era it registers, um, might it somehow, might energy somehow play a role in reproducing or even resisting a predominant energy culture? To do, to do literature, to invest, to inter interrogate literature and culture from the energy perspective is to ask, uh, you know, what happens? What happens if we sort, if we, if we sort texts, if we classify texts according to the energy sources that made them possible? So what happens if we reach out uh, our literary periods, you know, literary periods like 18th century and 19th century um, uh, liter literature, or uh, move, or when we kind of we teach we teach our uh, history of literature in terms of movements, uh, romanticism, classicism, modernism, postmodernism. What if we were to sort of uh, go back to the history of literature and 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 sort of rewrite it or or relook it? From the point of view of its bearing, uh, the bearing of energy, the bearing of the dominant source of energy on the literary output of a particular decade. So, what happens if we reach out, reach out uh, uh, literary periods and make energy source as a matter of urgency to literary criticism? So, it's like can we can we can we think, for example, of uh, modernism outside and outside an oil electric context, or can we think of realism without coal, uh, without steam. Uh, can you think of romanticism without wind or water? Is it, is it possible to think of literature without thinking about the ages, you know, ages of wood, uh, tallow, coal, gasoline, or any other fossil fuel, or even alternative fuel sources? Well, the answer would be not really, because in each of the ages, uh, the, the, production, the production of culture including the type of fiction, has been greatly influenced by the type of energy that has been extracted and that has been consumed. I mean, pause for a minute. Think of Dickens. Think of Dickens and 19th century Victorian age. How, how is it even possible to read Dickens and 19th century Victorian age without uh, thinking of soot and tallow candles? Uh, how is it possible to read Lawrence without thinking of coal mining and collieries? Uh, how is it possible to think of modern of modern uh, uh, modern literature uh, without thinking of Cormac McCarthy's you know uh, a novel such as Cormac McCarthy's The Road? Um, those of you who have read would remember. Uh, I mean, it's an apocalyptic. It, it's the, it, it, it is it is a story that places the world in a in a post It's in a post apocalyptic world where the Last survivors, everything else has uh, been destroyed because of uh, environmental, uh, because of pollution and environmental change, except for the last survivors of father and son and who, who are shown to trudge, uh, trudge on this absolutely nightmarish landscape. Uh, uh, they are walking. The entire narrative shows them moving from one devastated city to another devastated city along on a, on a bitumen shattered highway, uh, ironically using an oil company's uh, map as a guide. So, um, so when we look at, um, these are some of the, among the many questions when we read literature, uh, when we read energy narratives from the point of view of both ecology and, uh, and, and Marx. Um, Like I said, one of the most searing uh, texts written on oil explo exploitation and its devastating effects uh, that has come up in recent times is by this Indian writer, Helen Habila. Uh, it's as recent as uh, 2010. And, you know, from the title to the last scenes of the novel, oil, oil presents, or rather Habila presents oil as something that affects the mood, environment, and atmosphere. Uh, he sort of the entire landscape in the novel is a rather forbidding and, men and menacing petrosphere. And uh, what the story is, to put it in a nutshell, uh, 
as a what the story is, it, it tells this. Uh, it's about the kidnapping of a white woman in Nigeria who happens to be the wife, who is the wife of a British oil corporation instigated by local militants uh, who demand a huge ransom to free her. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is their way. This is their way of making the oil company pay for what they believe is fair compensation for the destruction, for the destruction of local lives and livelihoods by what they think is the greed and rapacity of uh, American, American oil, of the American oil company. So, you know, reading Habila's story from the, uh, from the, from an energy point of view sharply brings uh, for the, the terrible impact that oil extraction has had on the local environment and uh, its carnage on the rich wild and uh, including marine life in the Nigerian Delta. Uh, this is an example of what uh, uh, Patricia Lemenega calls, you know, the resource curse. Uh, she calls, this is an example of a novel which sort of deals with what one would call a resource curse. A resource curse meaning, um, you know, the tradition where um, where an oil rich, where oil rich places, places which are abundant in the reserves of oil, uh, are also the ones uh, which are steeped in abject poverty, uh, due to due to the extraction and exploitation of um, of multinational companies. So, so, so resource curse to find resource curse in a novel such as Habila's uh, Oil on Water is to look at uh, the problem of plenty. Or to look at what is called the paradox of poverty, where where mineral where mineral rich places in the global south are in fact the ones that are uh, the most underdeveloped, and which again shows to you the continuity the continuity of uh, colonialism and imperialism in new guises. So, um, um, let's see how we are doing with time. Uh, um, In, 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 you know, this is the second novel, uh, where, whereas oil on water uh, is an attempt to produce, you know, it, it sort of tries to produce an ecological voice, uh, the goal of which is to, is to decenter the human subject and in order to give more weightage to the ecological object. Um, in contrast to that, Cities of Salt, uh, written in, 18, in 1984 by Abdul, uh, Abdul Rahman Hanif, uh, works behind the scenes. I mean, oil is not very, it's, it's not in a very, it's not visible in a very direct way in the novel. And yet, yet when, you know, it, it, it can be looked at as a, it must be read as a, as an oil narrative. Uh, Cities of Salt was um, first published in Arabic and then appeared in, in, in the English translation in 1987. And interestingly enough, uh, Abdul Rahman Munif himself was an uh, oil engineer and an economist. Uh, and and in his many interviews, uh, he, you know, he says that when he talks about oil and especially its impact upon Saudi Arabia, uh, he looks at um, the the uh, you know the, the, the richness of oil reserves in Saudi Arabia as a sort of a lost lost opportunity for Saudi Arabia for the development of the Arab world itself, and he says that um, that. Underdeveloped countries, wherever oil has been found in rich reserves, in fact, has oil has become a damnation because it has sort of attracted uh, the greed of uh, greed and corruption of uh, multinational companies as well as the local governments. So international politics, also international politics in co in combination with capitalist greed, uh, sort of uh, has also led to the, to the destruction of the environment of these places. So this is a novel where again uh, the the main story is about a U.S. how a U.S. oil company discovers uh, land occupied by the Bedouin uh, community uh, actually is sitting atop a large deposit of oil and how the oil company officials they force the Bedouins to to abandon their traditional their traditional way of life and leave their own homes. So the Bedouin, the local population themselves, are forced to migrate. And those who remain are are compelled to work for cheap labor. So here is an example, two examples that I've given you of what I would call representative examples of fiction. However, so while, however, with a difference that while Cities of Salt sort of gently maps the the, the the transition from a traditional social formation to a colonial capitalist uh, 
society. Um, oil on water shows just how terrible uh, the future will be when this social formation, when this kind of a society, uh, you know, um, becomes more and more dependent upon oil. So cities of salt, in a sense, emphasizes wasted possibility, while oil on water describes the, the utter exhaustion of physical and social landscapes, which is which are birthed by a petrol by 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 petrol economy. The last um, example that I would give of, of an energy narrative or a petrol narrative is um, this short story titled "The Petrol Pump." It's a it's not a novel; it's a short story called "The Petrol Pump," uh, written by uh, the very by the very famous postmodern and realist writer Italo Calvino. And the story, although written, I mean, the story was written way back in 1974, but it is uh, it is sort of very prophetic. Uh, it's frighteningly, it is both frighteningly realistic and both prophetic in the way in which Calvino sort of captures the stress and anxiety of a society caught in the grips of a of peak oil crisis. And the story begins with this um, with this with a with this with an opening line that says, you know. Um, I should have thought of it before it's too late now. That's the very first line of the story. I should have thought of it before, but it's too late now. And this opening sentence of uh, Calvino's The Petrol Pump sort of echoes a guilt, you know, it, it's it's a kind of guilt-ridden, it, it resonates the guilt-ridden sentiment that most of us have from living as we do in an age where this zeitgeist uh, is fueled by a sort of an energy angst that we all suffer from. So the uh, the what do I what does the character when the character thinks what do I do next in your he's actually thinking about whether whether to fuel his whether to fuel his car or not to fuel his car even as uh, uh, even as the petrol pump stations are closing are closing are fast closing because uh, because there is a shortage of oil so the the character's initial dile dilemma uh, to fill or not to fill. Uh, is is sort of develop, develops in the story. It mutates into a sort of uh, anguished meditation on modernity itself, a modernity which obviously is fueled by oil. And uh, and the narrator in the story flays himself when he recognizes that uh, he too, like most of us, has slipped into uh, what uh, Calvino calls a gasoline junkie duck. He uh, the narrator, the character, the the narrator feels guilty for being a gasoholic, for using so much of petrol, for for you know, for visiting the petrol pump and tanking up his car so often, and for not having thought, for not having thought about how how he and others are guilty of uh, using up one of Earth's finite resources. And so, uh, what you see on the slide is uh, his his own thinking, his what he is telling in his mind. Uh, he says uh, the gauge has. The gauge has been warning me for quite a while that the tank is in reserve. They have been warning us for quite a while that underground global resources uh, can't last more than 20 years or so. So I've had plenty of time to think about it. As usual, I have been irresponsible. So like the narrator, are we also, are we also irresponsible? Um, <laughs> the point about the the point about the story, or shall we say, the ironic emission of Calvino's story is that it troubles us. It troubles us because it once again puts us, puts the same question in our mind. Uh, uh, what do we do? The question, what do we do once our cars have stalled and petrol pumps have run dry? And it sort of connects, I'm connecting it with the, um, with the documentary, crude, The Crude Awakening, which I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. So what do we do once... Uh, Cars cannot cannot bolt out of petrol stations because there is no more fuel. So one could uh, read, one may read Calvino's story or the empty gas station in Calvino's story as a sort of a metaphor, a premonitory metaphor for our current resource anxiety. And the powerful effect, this powerful effect of uh, Calvino's story comes through, you know, from the conflict between the characters' uh, nascent what what one might call petro conscience and the logic and the irrefutable logic of a petrol driven capitalism that drives us to consume oil even though we are aware that we are uh, that we are leaving uh, that we are causing carbon emission in our uh, atmosphere 
So this story, like many other petro narratives, sort of brings to the fore uh, the public consumption of oil, the privatization of guilt, uh, and the convenient, the convenient dismissal of a green ethical thinking. So what are the conclusions that we might draw uh, from this rather hurried investigation into what we call the narratives of petro fiction? Um, is, is oil cultural? Does it represent the cultural logic of late fossil capital? I would say yes, it does. Uh, because as, as Frederick Buell says, he says that energy history, the history of energy is inextricably entwined with the history of culture. And, and you see, you know, today when we talk about hydrocarbon narratives, to, to look at narratives in, in a new energy, in a new energy light, is to give traction to issues such as uh, resource exploitation, market capitalism, human displacement, species extinction, all those things that we do under, you know, as eco-criticism, climate change, fossil fuel, et cetera, et cetera, global warming. And I think there is a need, there is a need for to, to, re, to re-examine our own cultural modes uh, and to bring forth, to make visible the way in which uh, Petro, petroleum and energy are embedded. They may not be obviously visible, but they are embedded in these cultural narratives. In a sense, we what I'm what I'm trying to say is that we need more, you know, people like Greta Thunberg to launch <laughs> to launch uh, uh, school strikes for climate and planet, and more writers like Habila, more writers like Habila, to to stop and un, and undo our wanton our went in destruction of the environment. So the texts that I have examined, uh, given you as, an ex as examples, are, uh, show what uh, Frederick Buell calls, uh, you know, uh, he describes our oil society, our contemporary oil society, as an, what he calls exuberant catastrophe. And novels such as Habila's Oil on Water, stories such as Calvino's uh, The Petrol Pump, they, they sort of unearth, they reveal the real but hidden stories of oil. Um, what Amitabh Ghosh calls an embarrassing history. So petrofiction demonstrates that the human guzzling of a finite resource such as oil cannot go on endlessly. It, it sort of warns us of a future without fuel, of a future without fuel if checks and balances are not uh, installed immediately. So to go back to the question, why should we read oil fiction, if you ask me, um, well, because oil matters and because our planet matters. Uh, to ask what is petrofiction's role in our market-driven modernity, oil modernity, is like asking uh, what role did novels like Uncle Tom's Cabin or The Killer Mockingbird play in battling against racism? So the answer, therefore, is as I, uh, you know, as uh, is given in by by Buell, who argues that energy history is connected with uh, cultural history. And so the aim, the aim of petroculture or hydrocarbon culture, uh, it's our investigation of hydrocarbon culture, is to claim a space for critical literary and artistic uh, discourse engagement. So the, because, because, you know, the critical discourse on oil has been largely limited to the treatment of oil as a geopolitical and corporate, as a geopolitical and... Um, and, and corporate substance measured and valued in terms of petrodollars. But oil's, can, but oil's power needs aesthetic representation. It needs more and more writers uh, to, to sort of look at the possibility of bringing forth oil's invisibility, of making visible oil's invisibility. So um, fiction, therefore, the engagement of fiction, the engagement of fiction as well as nonfiction with oil uh, I believe will be crucial in the future in not only uh, exposing the sort of corporate fetishization of oil, but also in adding pitch, pit, and tar to green voices that tell us our planet matters and therefore oil matters. Um, these are, I thought I'll share with you some of the important texts, some of the important works that uh, are uh, considered foundational in energy, in the field of inter interdisciplinary studies, what we call energy humanities. 
And uh, these are also the works that I have studied and researched. Uh, I have been studying and researching on. So thank you so much. And, um, and I'll take any questions or comments or observations. Thank you, Dr. Pantik Banerjee, for your intellectually stimulating the topic, and also for taking time to expound your mesmerizing ideas regarding petrofiction, petroculture, ecological Marxism, dialectics of fuel, petro diaspora, and various other relevant topics within the text. I personally resonated with this keynote. For the fact that uh, my childhood was basically entertained in the Middle East, and I could actually uh, relate to a lot of aspects of petro fiction, as you know, the Middle East is the pioneer and the benefactors of the hydrocarbon economy, and is also, sir, in your own words, put it a combustile area for the writers like Abdul Rahman Munif from Saudi Arabia. Uh, also, uh, at this juncture, I would like for the audiences to post questions to the keynote speaker. Seems like there is an exhaustion of energy, <laughs> academic energy. <laughs> Well, it yes, uh, doesn't so really think... matter if, if uh, my suggestion would be that if and when um, uh, participants have any kind of queries, uh, I, I have posted, um, uh, you know, they can, they can address their queries, uh, they can mail or WhatsApp me. Sure, sir, sure, sir. I hope they, they would do that. I also have some, uh, I found your, as I said earlier, sir, I found your uh, keynote very riveting, considering the fact of, of about its relevance to me since I was born in the Middle East, especially in Saudi Arabia, country of Saudi Arabia. Petro, petro fiction was not something which I actually came to know until a very recent time, and I found it to be a very riveting area of study, especially in the recent time. So, what are you advice, doing, your... sir? Do you have? Uh, no, yeah. sir, I'm not doing a current, but I, as, as I said, I have a small interest and a proclivity to the area, considering that. It has a lot of aspects of my childhood in it as well. Because when you live in, a, and as you said, when you live in an environment on a hydrocarbon economy, it actually affects the entire ecosystem as well, especially with relatives to the tribes, the Bedouin tribes who had to be displaced for the upcoming developments. And one very important aspect, sir, that you've talked about was the vacuity of speech, especially in the petro fiction narratives. Uh, which is very important because none of those petro fiction stories are actually being told are uh, very popular. And what, uh, so I have this one question to pose to you, sir. Do you find that the petro fiction narratives, the relevance of petro fiction narratives, especially at the, considering the fact that we have reached COP26, where we are trying to cut down emissions and uh, many other factors. So what do you find the relevance of a petro fiction uh, narrative, especially in the post oil era, which is something that even the uh, global oil economies are also focusing on, that is diversifying from oil. So your thoughts um, on this? Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. And uh, uh, if I may call you Rohit. And, uh, um, and yeah, you know, one of the important things by which we can connect uh, our oil narratives or, in, or even the discourse on energy is to link it to the failure of the on uh, the recently held Glasgow summit on climate change, and um, you know, in recent history, the failure of climate change uh, or uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and the failure of the Glasgow Meet uh, points out again uh, to the undeniable to the undeniable fact that you know that when we are talking about uh, saving the uh, planet Earth. Uh, most of the political the political wisdom seems to be lacking. Uh, why? Because after all, 
the minute we talk about uh, reduction of, of carbon emission and to come, uh, we are looking at a dichotomy between the developed countries, the industrial, industrial rich countries of the global north and uh, the developing countries in the global south. And this is the central paradox about you know, energy and environment. On the one hand, uh, um, the, what we used to call the underdeveloped or developing countries of the 50s and the 60s, and India was one of them, uh, in order to play catch up, in order to play catch up with, uh, the, with, with, let's say, the United States, in order to play catch up all underdeveloped or developing economies, so were forced or compelled to explore the possibility of energy extraction and energy resources. But on the other hand, you know, down the years, uh, it's been 80 years or 90 years, down the, down the ages also, there is um, the more we or the more our political economy or industrial economies are dependent upon oil and its uh, supplementary products, the more uh, damage we are doing to our environment. Uh, there seems to be the geopolitics of, current, of, the, of present times seems to suggest that, you know, uh, countries like America, France and Canada, uh, who still are continuing, con uh, who are the major consumers of oil, um, seem to not believe, seem to, seem to you know, uh, believe that it's not their responsibility. There is a sort of privilege that they hold that, well, you know, now the responsibility of cutting down carbon emissions, of cutting down petrol, uh, fuel driven economies lies on, the, on countries such as India. And therein lies the paradox. I mean, if you want to move ahead and, and uh, be as, you know, have life, consumerist lifestyles as good as the ones in the West, then it obviously means that it increases our, ex our dependency. Our, there is a surplus of, on the surplus of oil. On the other hand, there is also the mitigating factor of environmental damage of climate change and global warming that, that will be its fallout, the negative fallout. So this is the paradox of energy-driven economies, and it's something that one can't shy away from. However, as I said, the failure of the of the of the of the Paris summit, as well as the recent Glasgow summit, suggests that there is no political wisdom because, after all, um, you know the impact of globalization and industrial capitalism is still fuel-driven, and so long as we think of short-term short-term benefits, short-term advantages, this is how the world will be. So when I, you know, planet matters, uh, planet matters is also to consider oil matters. And because oil matters, I think we need to be far more careful and cautious in, look at, look at for example, uh, only day before I was reading in the papers about how uh, from a sedan driven economy, we are now an SUV, we are becoming increasingly an SUV driven economy. Now, what does that mean? While it shows, for example, that our per capita income, it shows in the middle class, it seems to suggest that in spite of the pan being hit by the pandemic, we seem to uh, you know, have more per capita income and salaries and packages to buy higher models of cars. But the flip side is that SUVs are gas guzzling engines. So while everyone is lining up and booking up SUVs, uh, right? <laughs> well, it's the car companies that are, ha are smiling all the way, happily laughing all the way to the bank. But what about the environmental cost? What about the carbon footprint that we are leaving behind? So, so political economy, the, the narrative of political economy is a fuel-driven economy. And so perhaps uh, what needs to be done is to rewrite something that Arthur Haley wrote way back in the 1970s. He wrote Arthur Haley, the very, very famous Pulp Fiction writer. He wrote a, he, he wrote a, a novel, a best-selling novel that I, that I read in school, called Wheels, which is, about the, which is about the automobile industry in Detroit. So perhaps somebody like, uh, Ro, uh, somebody like you, Rohit, should take up and write, <laughs> write a novel <laughs> about your own Middle East experiences to bring to the, to bring, to make visible these petro narratives and their devastating impact. Sure, oh, sir, I'll ruminate on the same regarding <laughs> Mitra, ma'am, it's from Bhutan. Thank you for answering my question. No, I was. Yeah, just about I would to like to <laughs> contribute from a positive note, from a carbon neutral location. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I was about to say that. You know, Bhutan again is, as uh, Chitra Ma'am says, is a carbon neutral, which means that you know, even now, if you if you visit Bhutan, you won't find too many uh, 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 too many too many too many vehicles on there, and even if they are. 
I mean, the mode of transport, carpool, for instance, is something that we have not really worked upon. And there are, there are, there are no driveway lanes. There are specific lanes and zones in Bhutan where you cannot park, where you cannot bring your vehicles. So look at the, uh, can, can such a thing be done in India? Well, not really. When shopping malls are in the, in the center of the city, when shopping malls are in the center of the city and shopping malls uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, bring forth our uh, consumerist lifestyle. So in order to go to the shopping mall, well, we need our cars. <laughs> so it's a vicious cycle, actually. And a viscous one is there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would like to use the platform for further questions. So if any participants have any further questions. How many sessions do you have after this? Uh, so I think we have another session. session. And uh, what time? What time is the next session? Uh, next session is about two thirty. Two thirty. So I think the participants can energize themselves by having a sumptuous lunch and uh, <laughs> two back yes, two back to back uh, keynote addresses seem to have exhausted uh, people. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. So uh, once again, sir, I would like to uh, I would like to thank you and also my institution, the college. For allowing me to capitalize and on this opportunity to offer you the vote of thanks for this keynote session. Uh, I, I hope it has been a, a, a wonderful experience for you, sir, because definitely it was for us listening to your uh, keynote, uh, uh, very pedantic keynote on the not very well illuminated topic of petrol fiction. And I hope it gains traction in the literary research circles, especially uh, the entire gen energies studies as a whole, to gain traction. Military circle over the years. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank sir, you. again. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir.